a, a new series in the book of Judges. And we're going through that and seeing the relevance of that time to this time today. Uh, but uh, last week we started in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And so we'll read that first of all. We'll read the first 10 verses. So this is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Now, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. Okay, so we embarked on chapter 8, uh, verse 8 rather, this chapter last week. We saw that there is some value in physical training, bodily training. And so we saw that we've got a mandate to look after the world, to look after other people, and to look after ourselves and to take that seriously. There's some value, but godliness is value in every way. And so we need to prioritize godliness in our lives above physical exercise and above everything else because it has value in every way. There's no limit to its value because it's got value for the present life. And we looked at the life of Jesus and we saw in his humility, in his selflessness, in his generosity, what an amazing person he was and is and still will be. And we saw that wouldn't it be fantastic to be like Jesus, to be godly, so that's our aim. And we also saw that there's an even bigger picture, which you see in verse 10, uh, which is this expression that Paul says, this is something you've got to learn, you've got to accept, you've got to hold on to, that Christ Jesus is the Savior of the whole world, and especially those who believe. That's the bigger picture. There isn't anything bigger than that. So whatever comes in and crowds in on our lives and says, hey, I'm important, you need to kind of put it away and go, no, this is what really matters, that ultimately we are all, every single person made by God, but have departed from God and have sinned and are heading for punishment for those sins. Christ is sent into the world to be the savior of all people, the only savior for every single person and especially those who say, I want Jesus, I believe in Jesus, he's my savior. There's nothing bigger than that, is there, guys? So that needs to be the dominating thought, the dominating theme, the dominating uh, desire and motive of yours and my every day that people need to be saved. And I just mentioned briefly that we're going we're gonna to aim, we're going to make an aim, part of physical exercise, using the physical exercise analogy, is that there's a goal. I want to lose so much weight by, I want to be able to run this race, 5K, 10K marathon, whatever it is, by that certain date. So you set this goal. Our goal is going to be to get one person to church this, this side of Christmas, this side of the new year. If we can get one person to church, that's our aim. Because we want people to be saved, we'll make it our goal. I'm going to start praying for people that I know, that I love, in my family, my friends, my neighbors, my work colleagues, and I'm going to see if I can get one. 
something that's achievable, something that's reasonable, not something that's way out there and silly, one person to church. And that'll make a difference in this world for eternity. But this morning, I want to sort of start um, looking at the exercise program for Christians itself, using the exercise analogy again, and we'll do that this week, and we'll do that next week. Let me give you my three points, first of all, before we head into them. And my three points today are going to be, number one, grow in knowledge. Number two, be faithful. Number three, and this is Glenn Joyce's favorite phrase, I think, I'm not sure, it's the one that he's used with me more than any other phrase, keep on keeping on. That's right, Glenn, isn't it? Three, let me give you the three points again. One, grow in knowledge. Two, be faithful. Three, keep on keeping on. Firstly, point number one, grow in knowledge. Now, look at uh, chapter four of 1 Timothy. Look at verse one. He warns there, Paul does, about deceitful spirits, about these people who've devoted themselves to deceitful spirits and to teaching of demons. There's teaching that is deceitful and dangerous that you and I need to avoid. Uh, Later on, it talks about these irreverent silly myths. In verse 7, the actual Greek talks about old wives' tales. In chapter 1, he warns about uh, endless genealogies and arguing over things that just aren't that relevant. So there are lots of things that can lead us astray, and so we need to be aware of that. If you look at verse 6, it says, If you put these things uh, before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained, one key word, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine you have followed. Words of the faith, good doctrine, teaching that you have followed, trained in those areas. Uh, Then verse Nine, no, verse eight, rather train yourself for godliness. A couple of uh, uh, words before verse eight. Then verse nine, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. And to this end, we toil and strive. So there's a collection of words I want you to get there. These words are teachings, words of faith, good doctrine, and a saying that's trustworthy, all things to know. And you've also got then these words, being trained, train yourself, toil and strive. And so what Paul is saying here, and what God is saying to us, we've got to put in real effort, we've got to train ourselves in order to grow in the knowledge of the truth. And in growing in the knowledge of the truth, as opposed to stuff that's out there, which will lead you astray, you will grow in godliness and you will become more like Christ Jesus. So growing in knowledge is really, really important. Now, you may be thinking at this point, you may not, I don't know. I was. um, What's the balance here then between what the Holy Spirit does, what God does, and what we do? Am I not in danger of promoting something this morning that sounds a little bit religious, a little bit pharisaical? Guys, you've got to increase your knowledge here. You've got to work hard. You've got to train yourself. It's like, whoa, this is a bit religious. This is a bit pharisaical here. Isn't it the Holy Spirit who does all this? Is there a balance here that we need to understand? Because doesn't the Bible say the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and so on. So isn't it the Holy Spirit who just does this? Can't we kind of sit back and let the Holy Spirit do this? Well, let me take you to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. And I think this little section of scripture puts it really well. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Listen to what it says. His, that's God's, divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So it's God's power, okay? God's power is given to us, and then it's God's power 
that gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And it's through the knowledge of him. So we get knowledge of God. He gives us the power and we become more like him, more godly. Who has called us by his own excellence and glory, by which he has granted to us his very great and special promises. Now look at verse 5. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And with virtue, knowledge. And with knowledge, self-control. And self-control, steadfastness. And steadfastness, godliness. And godliness, brotherly affection. Brotherly affection, love. For if, you, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, and if you go to the next slide then, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's both, isn't it? Can you see that? So we've got God's power, God's divine power given to us so we can be partakers of the divine nature, this chapter says. He gives us everything we need for life and godliness. We need his power. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. It's the Holy Spirit that produces this fruit in us. But then he says, make every effort. But you've got to put it in as well. That happens God works, God does what only he can do, and we can't do anything without him when we actually put that effort in and we make every effort to add to our faith, virtue, and knowledge, and so on. There's a verse in the Bible, some of you will know it, which says, uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then the alarm bells go off then. It's like, whoa, how can you do that? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? And then there's the next bit, because it's God who works in you, both in your actions and even in your will and your choices. So it's both. Do you see that? Uh, you need to build your knowledge. You need to make commitments. You need to put effort in. You need to think, I'm going to train myself to be more godly. And foundational of that is I need to build my knowledge. I need to grow in knowledge every single day. Every single day. Jesus said, you need daily bread. Daily bread. Uh, let me give you a couple of phrases that might stick and might help you today. Uh, one phrase, belief dictates behavior. Let me say that again. Your belief dictates your behavior. Let me put it the other way. How you behave depends on what you believe. That's generally how we live our lives. Every single day, you'll have a set of things in your head that will be, this is what I need to do today in order to be happy, in order to get the most out of my day. And there'll be a whole set of beliefs framing the way in which you will behave. Now, everything in this world will be competing for your belief system which is why I think we've got to watch TV critically. It comes into our house. I, 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 there's one program I, I just I can't stand. Forgive me if you like it. Um, and there are probably programs that I watch that you can't stand and wonder why on earth I watch them. I just can't stand Love Island. Are you, are you with me on that? I, I, and it's growing in popular. I just think cause, because it's entertainment, people watch it uncritically. And because you watch it uncritically, you see the way people live their lives and the way people talk about relationships and how people do relationships and body image and a certain image of um, what you need to do in order to be happy and successful in life. And I just think you watch it uncritically, you take it on board, and it, you end up wanting what you see. You, you, you kind of are what you eat. We are what we eat on a physical level, we are what we eat on a mental uh, level as well. So you've got to be really careful with what we take on board, and we've got to be really careful with what we do put in in our lives. The Bible also says, doesn't it, Romans 12, 2, don't be, trans don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so what I want to recommend to you uh, right away from the get-go is every single day, if you want to grow as a Christian, if you want to become more godly, you need to be putting in that knowledge every single day. 
You need to be feeding on the word of God. You need to be growing by eating that bread of God every single day. Coming back to the uh, exercise analogy, I've been reading this week a uh, lot of tips on exercising to see what, what analogy crossovers there are. And there are just loads. And one of them is schedule in your exercise because your exercise is more important than your work. And the point that the person was making is that we schedule in appointments, we schedule in meetings, we schedule in when we go to work because that's important. Also, you need to schedule in your exercise. So if you get up in the morning at half past seven to go to work, you need to get up at seven o'clock for exercise. Schedule it in, put it in your diary, and then set your alarm clock to get up at seven o'clock. And that's kind of to make sure you do it. You need to schedule in your time with God in the morning. Got to do it. It's vital. So if you get up at half, half past seven to go to work, Set your alarm clock for quarter past seven or seven o'clock or whatever will work for you at your own point of growth in Christ at the moment so that you get up in the morning and you commit every single day to reading God's word and growing in knowledge. If you do that, you will start to grow. If you don't do that, you will go backwards. That's another fitness analogy. They say this, don't they, with fitness is if you keep it going, then you will get fitter and fitter. If you stop, you don't stay in the same place. You go backwards. Similarly in the Christian life, if we stop, we don't stay in the same place. We tend to start moving then further and further away from God and back into the world and in the thought patterns of the world. And we, and we not fall away from Christ, <laughs> but we are not anywhere near where we used to be and we should be. Let's move on to point number two. So first point is grow in knowledge. Second point, be faithful. Be faithful. Something that's really important we just hit on then is doing this on a consistent level no matter what. How many times in your Christian life have you been kind of hamstrung? Has your Christian life been tripped up in some way because of what has happened in your life? How many weeks have you had where you've got up maybe on a Monday morning and you thought, life really is lousy. I feel terrible. And whatever it is. And then as a result of that, it impacts your Christian life. And before you know it, you've just gone and you're nowhere near Christ anymore because of what's been going on in your life. Now, I want to I wanna read you a passage again uh, where Paul describes what's been going on in his life. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3, it'll be on the screen. Paul says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments. Do you know, Paul was beaten with rods three times. Paul was whipped 39 times five, on five occasions. Paul was shipwrecked three times. Paul was stoned, not as in drugs, obviously. Paul was stoned uh, because they were trying to kill him with bricks. Uh, once, J crazy things. That's what he told, he just, it, it, all, it all summed up in the word there, beatings. <laughs> and then it's imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God where the weapons of righteousness for the right and the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander, Hard being slandered, isn't it? Hard being criticized. And praise. We're treated as imposters, and yet we're true, as unknown, and yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet we're always rejoicing, as poor, yet we make many people rich, as having nothing, yet we possess everything. This is somebody who absolutely went through it. But you know what with Paul? Faithful. No matter what, God 
I'm going to keep going. No matter what, I'm going to be faithful. Let me mix my analogies now a little bit and move on to marriage as an analogy for be faithful. Some of you older folk in the congregation, uh, things were different when you got married, weren't they? When you got married and you said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death us do part, you meant it. The thought of, well, it may not work out, didn't even come into your thinking, did it? Because when you got married, you just thought, this is it. One person for life, so long as we both shall live. And so you committed. You weren't naive enough to think, this is going to be a bed of roses all the way. This is going to be really easy, and I'm going to feel lovey-dovey every single day. You weren't that naive, because there are times in every marriage where you just don't want to be with the person that you're with, and you'd rather be with someone else, or you'd rather be single. But in the older generations, they went into marriage with that thought of, this is it. I'm going to be faithful no matter what to the very end. That's how people did it. And so you have the older generation, and they're celebrating 40 years of marriage, 50 years of marriage, 60 years of marriage. And so you see all the folk, and you see how much they love one another, and you see how much they're devoted to one another, and you see how devastated they are when one of the the, the spouses then dies. That's being faithful. When God chose you, when God saved you, he said to you, I'm choosing you for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, whether you're sick or whether you're healthy, forever. I choose you. I'm going to be faithful to you. It says in Scripture, even when we are faithless, he is faithful. He says to us, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. No matter what we do, no matter where we go, no matter how we treat him, every single day he renews his covenant of love towards us and he promises, I am faithful to you. And so I want us to see reciprocating that to God. Can we be faithful to him? Because some days we get up and we feel, uh, I just don't want to do this today, do I? I don't want to read today. I'd rather press snooze on my alarm clock. It's cold outside the duvet, whatever it is. And I really don't want to do it. And to be honest, I don't, want, I don't feel like living for God today. And life is really hard at the moment. And I wish it was different. Can we remind ourselves that he's faithful to us? We need to remain faithful to him every single day, no matter what, for richer, for poorer, for in sickness and in health, forever. But I just want to encourage you as well that um, in the one sense, it says that when we're faithless, he is faithful. But there's another sense as well, which I just think is beautiful, in which you will always be faithful to God. You will always be loyal to God, and you will never leave him. You see, there's a, there's a verse in 1 John which says, they went from us. But the reason that they left us, they left our church, was because they weren't part of us. They weren't with us in the first place. In other words, they weren't truly saved. Those people who endure to the end shall be saved. There will be periods in your life and my life where we're not going to be faithful, where we're going to be faithless, where we're going to let God down, we're going to go astray and so on. But you know what? If you are truly born again, you are a child of God and nothing will ever change that. He will always be your father. He has set his love on you and will not remove that love. And he says to you, nothing, I won't allow anything to separate you from my love. And he puts his spirit in us, his Holy Spirit, and he doesn't take his spirit from us. And so no matter what we do, or no matter how faithless in some ways we are, and we move away from him, you know, don't you, 
Those of you who are truly saved, truly born again, you know that deep down, I love him. And I know I'm different. And I've always been different. And I always seem to be different. And you know what? You will always for the rest of your life be that way. And when you die, no matter how you've lived your life in one sense, when you die then and you go to be with God, he will welcome you in and he will say, good and faithful servant. Because that's how beautiful it is that he saved you and changed you. But I want to encourage us to be faithful nevertheless. So grow in knowledge, guys, every day, every day, every day. Grow in knowledge. Read the word of God and pray. Secondly, be faithful to it. See it as a covenant between you and God that you don't want to break. Be faithful. And then thirdly, keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Again, let's go back to the fitness analogy. Uh, sometimes when you do your fitness stuff and you, you turn over the new leaf and it's the new year and you make this commitment and you, you've done it for a week and you've done it for two weeks and you're going really well and then your diet just goes out the window, down the pan, and you pig out on so many cream cakes, it's unreal. And then you feel so bad and so guilty that you get the ice cream out there, and it's like, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> and it's like a vicious hook, and you're just going down and down and down and down. And the guilt sets in then, and there's kind of no return then, because you fail too many times. And the Christian life can be similar, can't it, in that, we fail all the time, don't we? We turn over this new leaf. We make this commitment to God. We go so far, and then it's like, what has happened here? Oh, man, I keep messing up. I keep failing all the time. Let me take you to one of the most beautiful verses, a couple of verses in the Bible. It won't be quite on the screen. I gave the not enough verses to Beth, unfortunately. But this is Lamentations. So if you find your way to Jeremiah... In the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then the very next book, a little book after Jeremiah is a book called Lamentations, and it's chapter 3 and verse 22. Listen to what it says. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Isn't that beautiful? Steadfast love. The faithful love is unceasing. He's always steadfast in his love. His mercy, his grace is endless It's limitless. And so with each new day, there's a new and exhaustive, inexhaustive portion of God's grace for us. Great is your faithfulness. And so you may be at a point where, you know, I've tried so many times and I keep failing. Well, can I just say to you, keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Because as far as God is concerned, your life up until now, this point, up until here, you've been perfect in his sight. You've lived your life just like Jesus lived his life. That's how he sees you. And today is a brand new start. He wipes the slate completely clean all over again. And he says to you, keep on keeping on. There's a story I read this week about a a mansion house in Scotland years and years ago. And there was a Scottish artist visiting. So this is in Scotland. And he was a very, very famous artist, apparently. And there was a stain on this wall that had been caused by soda water or something. And so there was this kind of ugly patch on the wall. And what this artist did when the family went out one day, he took his kind of like crayons or whatever he did. And around this stain on the wall, he turned it into this incredible waterfall surrounded by trees and woodland and so on, depicting 
the, the highlands of Scotland. He turned something that was kind of a stain into something beautiful. That's what God does with us. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't look at what we've done and go, that's just ugly. I'm condemning what, what a mess of a life that is. But he has this ability to come in and to work all things 